Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of All Access. I'm coming to you from uh, the Ava Labs offices today, so it's slightly a uh, it's a slightly different video setup. I think I look a, a different different. Uh, I look slightly different for here with uh, with a lot of these lights, and I decided that uh, I have to carry these lights with me everywhere I go because uh, they make me look a little bit better. Uh, in any case, so uh, let's uh, let's get started. There is a lot of things to discuss. It's been an exciting week. I think bear markets are fantastic. We've discussed this before. They are a great time to build. Uh, in a bull market, everything floats and, and everybody's making noise about everything there is out there. And you can't really differentiate yourself with better technology. Bear markets is when the better tech stands apart, the better tech comes to the forefront. That's exactly what's happening. So I'm actually quite pleased with where we are. And, uh, and I'm very, very happy to see all of the chains with no staying power fall behind and disappear. So that's all great. And uh, there's much more, of course, for us to do as the Avalanche community. But, uh, but let me give you a sense of what's going on. And um, let's sort of uh, go over the, the notable events of the week and then talk about what's happening. So um, the big, big announcement in the last two weeks was Hyper SDK. Hyper SDK is a new SDK, a software development kit for people who want to build their own virtual machine. Why might you want to build your own virtual machine? There's a gazillion reasons for it. So um, a regular virtual machine like the Ethereum virtual machine or the Avalanche virtual machine for that matter, the one that powers the exchange, these are things that are designed for general purpose use. So the designer had some prototypical idea of what the, what the uses would be, but really did not want to curtail any specific use and had to build a general purpose machine that's suitable for all. That means that it's not specific to any specific reason, any specific purpose. And there are many, many, many people out there who have a specific thing in mind that they would like to get done very, very efficiently. Uh, these might be, involve things like uh, cryptographic pairings. So you might want to, for various zero-knowledge proofs, you might need a certain pairing, which is a, a fancy, uh, fancy way of relating numbers, so to speak. Um, you might need support for certain pairings that just aren't there in the Ethereum virtual machine. You might need different kinds of gas. You might want to say, hey, look, you know, the gas, uh, the way the gas is, cost, uh, is accounted for is not appropriate for my application. You might want to have all sorts of other different features where you want to say, hey, look, I do matrix operations all the time. I need matrix ops. And the EVM obviously doesn't allow that. In fact, the EVM is designed in a way that makes it very difficult to write efficient math. And if you're a math heavy, uh, if you're doing a math heavy DAP, then you might very well want to have certain customized uh, operations that make those matrix uh, multiplies, et cetera, very, very efficient for you. I can go on like this. There are many other operations that you might want to have specific to your use case. You might want to have a virtual machine that's specific for storage. The EVM is not good for storage. You wouldn't want to build Filecoin powered by the EVM, but you might very well want to have your own VM that has specific features for storing blobs and recalling blobs and maybe running challenges to see that, that you have the blob stored. Um, those kinds of things are additional features. You could probably do some of them by using programming on top of a general Turing complete virtual machine like the EVM, but the gas costs would be prohibitive. You could do matrix multiplies in the EVM, except your word size is 256 bits. It's not going to be efficient. If you're doing, uh, you know, whatever you're doing, if you build it into your VM, it'll be so much better, so much more efficient. So um, this SDK is designed to accelerate custom virtual machine development. You want to do something that's specific to you, take this SDK, and in no time at all, you can go build whatever it is that you want to build. It's very flexible. It's very easy to use. And to prove this, Patrick O'Grady, the main developer behind this, also uh, our head of engineering at our VP of engineering at Ava Labs, Patrick O'Grady has been doing a bunch of development in the open. And uh, you don't really get to see this all that often. I, when I was a student, I, you know, the main thing I wanted to do was to be a, a, a fly on the wall uh, when great hackers like Ken Thompson um, were, were writing code, right? In fact, I managed to do exactly that. I went to AT&T Bell Labs and hung out with Ken and Dennis Ritchie uh, and watched them write, write uh, operating systems code. So 
Patrick is giving you that experience for free out in the open. Just go follow his Twitter account and you will see him uh, develop code on top of the Hyper SDK, take blind, you know, go into blind alleys, take wrong turns, back out of his decisions, decide that he's doing it wrong and, and go back to the beginning. All of the mistakes and missteps also, as well as all of the right things he did are visible for all of us to follow along with. And it's really fun uh, to watch. It's, it's, you get, I think I got the sense that it's actually fairly easy. And if I had about three days, I could build a custom VM. And uh, now custom VMs don't make sense for other chains, right? Ethereum is not going to have a custom VM. They have the EVM. They're done. For us, for Avalanche, a system with multiple chains in parallel, with, with some of these chains dedicated to use cases, they make perfect sense. So the Dexalot chain, for example, should have a VM in it where that VM gives you the matching primitive of different orders. It's a DEX and it's implementing everything as, as on top of the EVM and it's paying gas costs for this. That could be made far more efficient if it were built into the EVM, well, into the VM, and uh, they could easily use Hyper SDK for this. There's so many examples. And, uh, and now there is now an SDK that supports it. Take this stuff, build your own, whatever you might want to do. Are you uh, porting something from the Web 2 world to Web 3? and you want efficient operations that allow you to do what you want to do, the core of your, your hard task, whatever it might be, Hyper SDK is for you. So uh, it's just a lightning fast environment. A few hundred lines of code will get you to specialize it. There is a lot of support structure there. It's designed by people who know what they're doing for other people who may or may not know what they're doing, but it's designed to sort of keep you on the rails, give you something that works well. And, uh, and it does cut down on VM development from multiple months to a few days. And I do mean this, like without this SDK, it would have taken you or me multiple months to build a bare bones VM. With this, there's so much there, so many modules and components that you can mix and match and, uh, and get something up and running in a few days. So I'm really thrilled about this and, uh, and can't wait to see what the community will do uh, with, with Hyper SDK. So let's move on to the second big announcement from, uh, from the last week, and that's Loco. And uh, Loco is the, uh, the biggest esports streaming provider in India. And uh, they have about 50 million users. And uh, they decided they chose Avalanche. It's like the hashtag chose Avalanche. They chose Avalanche to, uh, to port their streaming platform onto. They're bringing a su suite of uh, Web3 products and um, they are, they're going to be using a custom Avalanche subnet. So I'm excited. I, I think uh, initially, th this is typically the way I see these uh, deployments going. The people who want to come in, especially the Web2 uh, giants like Loco, um, they already have a ginormous user base. They want to uh, partake in blockchains. They want to bring their users over. The initial experience they offer to their users is one that, uh, that makes the blockchain transparent. The users interact with the chain, but they have no idea that they're doing so. They think it's actually a website. Well, I don't know what goes on inside the mind of a regular user, but typically they don't even think about what's going on behind the scenes. They just click something and it happens. And it happens so fast because the, 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 the system is so fast. So, um, so that's what Loco will initially be doing. And, uh, but as these users start branching out, as they start to experiment with NFTs, as they start to take their... Uh, their assets and, and, and start doing other things with them, perhaps take them to uh, other subnets, perhaps use them as collateral, perhaps use them in other games other than the one in initially intended for those NFTs. Suddenly you end up having on-chain activity and we convert these 50 million users slowly uh, into, into 50, million, uh, 50 million users in a single silo to 50 million users across the entirety of our chain stack. So I'm really excited, and um, Loco is really big. I am planning to visit India as well at some point in the next few months, and, uh, and I can't wait. This is going to be so much fun to see. 85% um, of top gaming creators use Loco, and uh, it's been growing like crazy, 900% growth in daily active users. And, uh, and, and just so you get a sense of the scale of this thing, the Loco Legends uh, waitlist which is, this is the thing that's going to use the subnet, has already 165,000 people on its waste, wait list. So uh, that's far more than our co co competing chains that want to come in and use this thing. 
And, uh, and I'm thrilled about this. So can't wait to see this happen. Yet another big announcement, Tencent. So uh, uh, it's a cool Rubik's Cube. Or it's not a Rubik's Cube, but you get the idea. Um, unsolvable Rubik's Cube. Tencent is, uh, is a leading tech company used by some of the big developers. And uh, they're bringing Avalanche to users of Tencent Cloud. So this is, again, in the same vein as Alibaba, AWS, and a bunch of other cloud providers. They all realize what the game is. They understand the assignment. The assignment is create blockchains for specific use cases, create assets, uh, create digital assets out of other assets that you already have, and allow people to, to interact with each other on the blockchain you've created according to the rules you've set up. So as that happens, there's going to be a lot of need for people who are running their nodes. I think that's exactly what Alibaba initially realized. It's exactly what AWS realized. And now we have Tencent in the game. So once, once the Tencent uh, cloud infrastructure is there, you can do very rapid and efficient node deployment. I get some questions about, hey, are you not worried about AWS centralization? What does that mean? What does it mean for the C chain? Let me answer those right now. It means nothing for the C chain. Nothing's changing on the C chain. So this is an offering for subnet creators. That's one. Two, um, is, is the expectation that a subnet creator will go to AWS and create a, 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 a chain where the validators are all in AWS? No, that's not the expectation. The expectation is that when a subnet creator goes to create a chain, they have their pick and, and choice out of uh, Alibaba, AWS, Tencent, and all the other cloud providers, and GCP and all the other cloud providers. So how would that work? Well, that works as follows. Instead of launching everything you've got initially on AWS, you pick one from this and two from that, and obviously from different availability zones, so that if AWS East Coast is having a problem, AWS West Coast is up, etc. So you pick your nodes, and that creates the seed of your decentralized failure-resilient blockchain, and uh, if you have a dynamic blockchain, then people come in with their nodes on their own ISPs, et cetera, and it grows from there. And if people want to come in, if other people want to come in from AWS infrastructure, they can too. It's, it's actually quite easy for them. So win-win all around. It makes blockchains more accessible, uh, blockchain launches more accessible to developers. Uh, so this is great. This is the kind of uh, step that you need before this thing goes really, really, really public. So this is not exactly for retail. This is really for the devs who are launching the chains and it makes their lives a lot easier. So instead of, again, weeks and weeks of work, now you can do just one command line, uh, you know, start up your node and there you go off to the races. That's uh, kind of it, but there were a bunch of different exciting things that happened this week. I know you guys will have a gazillion questions. So let's, uh, Let's uh, let's start taking them, and uh, because I'm in a foreign environment here with the mouse that doesn't have the right number of buttons on it, I actually don't know how to scroll. So uh, that's kind of funny. Um, so uh, uh, so here's a question: All Ethereum layer twos have a centralized indexer or sequencer. That's exactly right. Why not use Avalanche subnets to build a decentralized Ethereum layer two? Great question. And in fact, you can build Avalanche, uh, you know, to, to do exactly this. And um, it's supremely easy and totally doable. And I wanted to do this as a, as a stunt. I wanted to go to one of the layer twos, take their code and uh, port it to, to Avalanche so that it's both a subnet and an, and an Ethereum L2. And uh, the only thing standing in my way was none of these codes, code bases were worth taking. I looked at them, they all had centralized components. And if I took them, they'd, they'd offer no value. I was just like, this is crap. It doesn't live up to, uh, live up to layer twos, uh, you know, either values, it doesn't live up to any of the, the advertising for layer twos. The only thing going for it are the, the fact that the, the Ethereum maxis have uh, glommed around certain of these layer two offerings and they wouldn't, they wouldn't put their weight behind the, the one that I created. So, um, so that's why I, I did not do this. Um, but, uh, but there's a funny game being played there. It's, it's just all social stuff. Uh, Technology-wise, there's nothing holding you back. You can totally do this. It would be decentralized. Uh, the in indexing and sequencing would be decentralized. 
You could have a dynamic subnet. You could allow people to come in and out of your network. Uh, it would work beautifully. And uh, it's all out there, you know, yours for the taking. Go do this. It's completely possible. Um, Dexalot showed that it's possible to straddle multiple networks. So you can straddle both Ethereum and Avalanche. You can be registered on the Avalanche P-Chain. You can be an Avalanche subnet and uh, share security with, with Ethereum by checkpointing your state onto Ethereum. And uh, so I could, I could have done this. I didn't. I thought I'd be a fraud. I thought that the other layer twos whose code I was stealing from were kind of fraudish because they, they make a certain set of noises. And then the code, when you look, doesn't live up to it. I couldn't find fraud proofs anywhere. So, so I thought I could take this stuff, but it really offers no security. You're just trusting the operator. This is kind of crap. So, um, so that's why I didn't do it, but you totally could. Okay, so let's see. Let me see if I can uh, learn to uh, scroll here. How does one scroll? I have no idea. So we'll ask the team to, uh, to help me scroll here. But um, here is a question that I can see uh, on my view here. How does one become an expert in a topic like consensus protocols or virtual machine design? This is a great question. Um, I think the answer is, is not what people would expect me to say. I think they would expect me to say something like you have to go to school. You don't. Um, you have to pour your heart and soul into, into this. Uh, and then I think the saying is 10,000 hours will make you an expert. So, um, so to become a true expert, it will take about 10,000 hours of of living and breathing consensus protocols or virtual machine design. You do not need to go to school or grad school or anything else, uh, but you do need to put the time in and, uh, and you will find it very, very difficult to do this on your own. Typically, most people find it in incredibly difficult or impossible, um, but it's possible. I, I've met people, I was just, we just hired someone. I was just talking to someone yesterday that, uh, uh, that joined the uh, Ava Labs, amazing programmer, amazing hacker, and, uh, and completely self-taught, didn't even go to university. So, um, so you can just become an, become an expert by, by studying up. Uh, but uh, the easier way of doing this, especially consensus protocols or virtual machine design, is to go to grad school. And, uh, and uh, you, need, uh, you probably need to go to a, a master's program or a PhD program because the topic is advanced. It is not something that's taught in undergraduate courses. Undergraduate courses will take you all the way to maybe operating systems, maybe distributed systems, based depending on the school you go to, if they have someone who, who is good at the, in, in, on, the, on that topic. But, uh, but to really delve into it, you have to take master's or PhD level courses, and um, it will take some years of study to understand the nuances of all the consensus protocols. Uh, it took me a lot, a lot longer. I would say it took me 20 years of studying, self-study, uh, to become an expert. But, uh, but, but that's because the materials that in our time weren't very well developed. And now I think the topic is far better understood. And uh, you can quickly go through all the old classical protocols in the space of a year or so. Um, you know, if you study one of them, it'll take you about a month. Maybe you implement one of them, you implement PBFT. You try to, uh, you'll make a bunch of mistakes. You figure out where the mistakes were. Um, PBFT is very close to Tendermint, for example or you do Ben-Or, and uh, Ben-Or and Signature Accrual are very, very similar to EOS and Ethereum 2. So just study up on those, and, um, and in a year you will, have, you will be a, an expert at, um, at uh, classical consensus protocols. And uh, it's not a very deep topic. It's, it was considered very esoteric when I was in grad school. Uh, it was considered like, you know, the, the kind of things that that people did who were really, really expert at distributed systems. And, um, and nowadays, I think they're fairly well understood. Their reasoning, their correctness properties are based on fairly simple principles. And um, there's a new crop of protocols, of course. Avalanche and its analysis is different. You might want to spend a little bit of time um, studying up on Markov chains and a different kind of analysis for uh, reasoning about modern protocols like Avalanche. But uh, that too will take you, what, at most another six months maybe at most another year, but in two years, you should expect to become an expert. I have so much more to say on this. I've watched hundreds, if not thousands of students go through this process, and, um, and uh, it's a very predictable process. So, uh, you know, at the end of, at the beginning of the first year, everybody has imposter syndrome. You know, everybody feels overwhelmed. They're like, oh my God, there's so much to learn. 
And, uh, and then at the beginning of their second year, everybody has learned enough that, uh, that they become really dangerous, actually. It's the, it's the, uh, the, the most insufferable people on, on the planet are the, our second year graduate students because they know, they know just enough to be dangerous. They know the terminology and then they feel like they are, you know, they feel like everything that, that's happened before them is crap. They, they themselves haven't done jack shit yet. So they don't understand how hard it is to, to actually improve the knowledge of humankind. So, so third year grad students, the ones who've, had, who've tried to build their own from scratch and who've tried to, to, uh, to compete with what came before them, they understand how hard uh, it is to, 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 to expand our knowledge of the universe, our knowledge of these protocols, and, uh, and they have humility and then they, you can begin to talk to them again. Now, if I look at communities on this topic, there are wholesale communities that are stuck in, you know, essentially in a, in a holding pattern where they're two months into their graduate studies, right? So they, they make a lot of noise. They generate the kinds of like, you know, messages that all these first year grad, grad students generate or worse, some of them generate a lot of messages of the kind that second year graduate students generate. And, uh, and they, they, you know, they, they're stuck in that pattern. They, they need that extra help, the extra push to give them a breakthrough to allow them to actually you know, go, go from where they are to the next level up. And if they can't do that, then they're just constantly just churning the same stuff. And uh, you see this in, in the blockchain. So I see this in the blockchain chain space all the time. There are a lot of people who talk a lot. They talk a big game. There is no delivery. And, uh, and if you come up with something new, they have all these like terminology and so forth to throw at you, but, but there is no substance. Um, anyway, so uh, uh, but you should be able to do this on your own. You should be able to become an expert in about two years uh, to three, maybe if you're on your own, uh, but two if it's part of a structured study. And if you want a good starting point, uh, the Distributed Systems course at Cornell University, I think it's a 5,000 or 6,000 level course. It's a master's or PhD level course. Take a look. Uh, the slide decks, et cetera, they should cover all, everything you want to know about classical consensus protocols. Um, the, uh, there's another book if you want to get into proof of work protocols and cryptocurrencies. There's a good book by um, Andrew Miller and, uh, and Ed Felton and others. Um, it's the, uh, the Princeton book. So Google Andrew Miller, Bitcoin book, Princeton, something like that, but from Princeton Press. And uh, it's a great book. It's a good, good book to start with if you want to learn about proof of work protocols. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, I, am I surprised at how quickly BTC.B is being adopted? What do you see the best use case for this being right now? No, I'm not surprised at, at how quickly BTC.B is being adopted. I think it's slow. I'm always like a, and if the, you know, the, the, the usual listeners will have, have picked up on this. I'm a go, go, go kind of person. I'm a get, get, get stuff done, get shit done kind of person. And uh, to me, if there is something that's technologically better, you know, uh, I would just take that immediately. And I wouldn't, wouldn't think twice about leaving the old thing behind. So, um, uh, so BTC.B should have been adopted by everybody. It should have billions in TVL already uh, the day it was announced. So uh, it takes a while for, you know, information to sink in. It takes a while for people to figure out, you know, the, the impact of new inventions and new, new, uh, new assets. So we are slowly waiting. I think it's very, very slow. Now, on the other hand, I have to say, yes, there's been a lot of growth lately. Just yesterday, I think 200 million more came in. And uh, I looked into how that's being used. You know, is it being used to be swapped immediately into some other asset or is it actually finding its way into DeFi? People are using it in, in Benki, in Aave. So they're borrowing against it. Uh, they're doing Benki things with it. So, uh, so people are actually using it as the, the kind of collateral uh, that it is. And uh, it's serving exactly the function that it ought to be serving. It is also good for Bitcoin payments. And uh, on that, in that task too, it, it can be used. So if you want to pay people, if you want to pay people with micro, uh, you know, whatever, Satoshi payments, like slivers of Bitcoin, uh, you can do that incredibly fast. You can do it without any route finding. You can do it without any failures. So unlike uh, layer two is built on Bitcoin, uh, this, is, uh, this asset is different in the sense that it is Bitcoin, but it's on the avalanche consensus protocol. So it moves really, really fast. What do I see as the best use case? Uh, collateral. Bitcoin is fantastic for collateral. The community 
the Bitcoin community sees it as a store of value, of course, and uh, and so they don't want to part with it. Why would you? I wouldn't want to part with my Bitcoin in the current environment. So, uh, but if they have liquidity needs, then they can put the Bitcoin up as collateral and borrow against it. And there are all sorts of studies on this, and uh, and uh, it's just often just vastly superior to borrow against your holdings than to sell it and uh, get the cash out. Selling also creates all these tax liabilities and so forth. So um, it's definitely worth a look. I think it's it's a fantastic product. Um, so oh, my, my team is just throwing these questions, but uh, let me ask this one. How do you manage software teams and, and projects at Ava Labs? How does it differ from other com companies? I want to say a few words about this because I do have a very strong opinion on, uh, on how to do things that is different from what you see at Google, from what you see at Microsoft, from what you see at Facebook. So we do not follow any of the procedures that you might be familiar with at, uh, at any of these FANG companies. And I'll tell you why. These FANG companies are typically monopolists. They sit on top of a, a giant space they have no, like they are the incumbent, they have no meaningful competition. And, uh, and so the game that they play is one of conservative delivery with typically mediocre people. Uh, I'm gonna say this and now it's, I, I just offended everybody. <laughs> so, but uh, take your typical team uh, working on something or another, some feature at Google and they're, they're fine, but they, they don't produce much. Google Maps has made no changes in the umpteen years it's been around. And it is far from a, a good application. Try using it in New York. Right? Does Google not have workers in New York? They, they must. Do they, do they not use Google Maps? They must. Are they not aware that it's really a terrible application when you're navigating New York? They must be aware. And yet somehow, whatever processes they have are not very good at delivering, uh, de delivering uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of new innovation. So um, what they do do is they have these, uh, these, these processes that are designed to get reliable, reliable, predictable, um, low risk improvements from, from teams without any stars in them. How about that? Let's just put it that way. So that's um, everything that you read, like, you know, the, the coding interviews, that's all, all, everything that they do is designed to, they do the weeding up front and then once people come in, it's just sort of a giant country club atmosphere. I think they, they, they spend a lot of time discussing political issues internally. And, um, and then they, uh, you know, the typical thing that they do is, is very few lines of code and uh, very few changes, but very reliable and very much on a very padded timetable. So things get padded. It gets done slowly. I'm not sure if it gets done well, but it definitely gets done slowly. We operate differently. And uh, long, long ago in my career, I read about the IBM super programmer approach, and that's what we, we, uh, we subscribe to. The IBM super programmer approach was, a, was an experiment in the late 70s, early 80s, I believe, that got written up. And uh, essentially what you want to have is one amazing architect behind every product. That architect is the person with the big grand vision, and they, they have typically a, a wing man or a wing woman and a wing person. Uh, and, and so working with their wing person, they write a lot of code. The idea is you write a lot of code very, very fast. Your wing person keeps tabs on everything that you did not, that you left, you know, where you cut corners essentially. And, and the job of the wing person is to make sure that all the cut corners are, are, are properly squared up later on. And, uh, and, uh, and then there is uh, the rest of the team is there to ensure that the, uh, the super programmer can, uh, can operate fast and effectively. That's what we do. And uh, so this is very different from the equal division that you see in, in many different big companies where you take a big task, divide it into equal chunks, everybody gets a little bit, and then you wait for the slowest person, you resync, you remerge, and then you redivide, et cetera. We don't do any of that. We have, a, we have one person whose job is to take the ball and run to the end goal. And that's incredibly different and a very different dynamic internally than uh, what you see at other companies. Um, at a social level, at a management level, it requires a completely different management uh, management style. And, um, and it requires a different recruiting style. 
and uh, and I think it gives it pays back huge dividends. This is something that I did as a professor with my with all of my projects. Every single graduate student is the super programmer behind their own thesis, of course, and then others would have helped them, of course, along the way uh, that, to that thesis. At Alva Labs, we do the same thing. And, uh, you know, on Project X, you know, person, some person one might be, might be the lead. On Project Y, person one might be a support person or a wing person for person two. And person two is the lead, is the super programmer of Project, project Y. And project Z, of course, has yet another person in it who is the lead, who is the super programmer, etc. We don't necessarily identify the super programmers. We are not very rigid in how we do that division. But, uh, but we do everything to foster this culture of, of people taking ownership, full ownership, uh, people running to the end goal, the, end po the, 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 the goal, goal posts, and then going back and, uh, and uh, squaring up all of the cut corners. And uh, we have a track record, I think, of the most, most uh, I don't know what the word is, most delivering uh, company. We've developed so many products. We already spun out another company, Enclave, that market got spun out of Ava Labs. And uh, we have a platform, a wallet, um, uh, a bridge, of course, two, two different bridges, two different kinds. Um, now now um, we have a cloud offering, a blockchain as a managed service for people who want private, private blockchains. And now we have, um, uh, we have uh, the Enclave work that we, we spun out. So uh, we managed to do this. Uh, based on this approach, I think it pays dividends and it's very, very different from everybody else out there. So, um, so yeah, you guys asked and that's, that's my quick answer. Um, so let's see. Bank of England published a working paper and they consider avalanche and Ethereum for CBDC, though they document some concerns. Would love to hear your opinions. Yes, I spoke to the Bank of England on multiple occasions. Um, happened to know a bunch of the people there. Fantastic set of people. I think they are the most sophisticated central bank when it comes to uh, blockchain issues. They are ahead of everybody else. Um, I think the Fed is okay, um, but they are they're sort of fast following. And I think maybe that's on purpose. Um, and uh, I think Singapore, etc. There are a couple of central banks. I spoke to Bank of Japan, uh, spoke to uh, you know, I spoke to a whole bunch of central banks back in the day. And um, and uh, uh, so, yes, among all of them, I would say Bank of England is the most technically sophisticated. And so they know all about Avalanche, of course, because they, they know the field. And, uh, uh, you know, the CBDC use case is a complicated one. I haven't had a chance to read the working paper yet. So I just sort of skimmed it a little bit. They uh, They have so many concerns. And and launching a CBDC is a really complicated thing. And um, so um, my, my sort of short take on this is, uh, you know, when you talk to them, they have a lot of stakeholders and they have to make sure that whatever they come up with can be used by you know, all sorts of people. It's easy to use sometimes. In fact, Bank of Canada, for example, had a list of requirements that ended up including people without a smartphone should be able to use this blockchain offering. I mean, you can try and make it happen with QR codes and so forth, but it's very difficult. They, 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 they end up having to worry about obvious accessibility. You know, like it's, it's just, there's a, which you have to care about, of course. So all of that makes their life very, very difficult. Um, so what do I expect to happen in this space? It's very simple. In June, there is going to be the Chinese Communist Party meeting. And if at that event, uh, Premier Xi mentions blockchains, the West is going to freak out and every single central bank will rush to compete with the Central Bank of China because there will be a perceived threat to the dominance of the US in, in the financial systems uh, universe. Um, that's what happened last time Premier Xi said something. So, uh, so I think uh, there's a very good chance that he'll say something again and it's going to be, you know, we'll be off to the races. If he doesn't, uh, then um, uh, there will be some other entity, some other central bank that starts to step in. And again, that will get all the other central bankers to have their own dose of FOMO. Um, at the moment, post-pandemic, central bankers have their hands full. So most economies are sputtering at best. Uh, they're having issues with inflation, with, uh, you know, with, with economic activity grinding down to a halt, or 
the economic activity changing shape with work from home, with the, with all the changes we made during the pandemic. So they have to do a whole bunch of things, and CBDCs are not necessarily the the highest, most pressing item for them. So, uh, so that's sort of what I think at the moment. But uh, but we'll see what happens come June, and we'll see what happens after that. All right, let's see. Um, uh, I, I really just can't. Why can't I like scroll up? I, it's just how do other people scroll up? Uh, we'll we'll find out. So, um, uh, okay. Let, ooh, I know how to scroll. Oh, look at this beautiful. Um, so uh, uh, let's see. I would like to hear comments about BTC.B. What are the projections? I expect that BTC.B is going to be uh, bringing about a few billion in TVL to Avalanche. That's my expectation. Why do I expect this? Because I think, um, you know, why not all of it? Well, because uh, a lot of BTC is, is locked up in cold storage, so it's not, that's not gonna come over to us. Uh, but wh why that much? Well, I think some BTC will come over as it has for DeFi. There'll be more people who understand the value of borrowing against your Bitcoin as opposed to selling it. I don't, I don't think anybody wants to sell their Bitcoin. So, um, so you can go do that on Avalanche most easily. It's trivial, very, very fast and quick. So I suspect that the amount of money that's, uh, that's interested in that is at least a few billion uh, or could be interested in that is at least a few billion, probably far more. So, um, so that's my, 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 uh, my speculation on how big that market could be. And um, I'm excited about it. Let's, let's see what happens. We, we have all the right tooling in our, uh, in our chain. Okay, regarding subnet adoption, how early are we? And considering the timeline this idea takes to mature and become mainstream, would you consider that Ava Labs is, is on schedule or you'd expect all this to have more adoption so far? So we're very, very, very early. We only have about, uh, I don't know what, two dozen or so really big subnets or, or somewhat big subnets. And we should really, you know, before we consider the opening chapter done, I would expect there to be like, I don't think the opening chapter is done until we have a hundred subnets. That's sort of my mark. And uh, so we have, we, have a, we have a few dozen, that's good, but it's just still in the starting fa uh, phases. The exciting stuff is just beginning to happen. We talked last week or the week before, we talked two weeks ago about the Dexalot dual, dual, uh, dual chain approach. And that's groundbreaking. It's groundbreaking in the entire crypto space. I don't know of any other dApp that straddles multiple chains. So, um, so we're gonna see more innovation of that kind and uh, that's coming. And um, I think we're generally on schedule. Um, I do think that we, are, we were set back. We were set back a little bit. Well, were we set back? We weren't set back in the bull market. Uh, in the bull market, as I mentioned, all crap floats to the top and you end up having to compete with Luna you end up having to compete with all these chains that have no staying power. You know, there's one, there's only one dev, and uh, he already he already wants to retire. And uh, and as soon as 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 the bear market begins to show its face, that person disappears, and suddenly you never hear from that chain again. Uh, so that 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 all happened. I don't know that that affected subnet adoption so much, but the FTX crash did. So um, a lot of people just sort of. Uh, uh, decided to uh, to delay their subnet launches because nobody wants to launch into a sea of negativity. So Sam really killed us all by um, by uh, by doing what he did and uh, set us back at least six months, uh, probably more, because of the the sort of the downstream implications and ramifications. So that's where we are. Um, but uh, it's picking up steam. So uh, the I just counted. I had counted the number of subnets on testnet. That was 118 um, last fall. And, uh, and then just last week, I was told, I was like, yeah, you know, so what's happening with 118? And they're like, what 118? I'm like, you know, subnets, the testnet subnets that are ready to be deployed. Uh, then that number has ballooned to 600. So there are a lot of people staging their subnets. I wouldn't expect all of them to go to production on mainnet. But, uh, but there is a lot of uh, demand for subnets. They're coming online one by one. And um, as you know, we have uh, all sorts of games and so forth coming online. We have Loco coming online, et cetera. So there's gonna be a lot of usage, uh, I think, just extrapolating from obvious public facts. 
uh, that, that we can see. Okay, so uh, let's see. Um, let me see. Is it possible to build a VM using the Hyper SDK that enables a DApps front end to also be hosted in a decentralized manner among the subnets nodes? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's just uh, storage of the front end JS stuff. And you could totally do this. There's nothing holding you back. Um, just uh, build your, create a dynamic subnet, force all the validators to hold the, um, the front end JavaScript code and serve it out of them. And uh, maybe make those validators act as web servers. So instead of, um, instead of going, to, uh, going to a particular website, you go to, you know, to any one of these uh, validators, download the front end and have it communicate with the back end. Now for additional points, connect that to, to a uh, P-chain OAR DNS resolver so that when I look up a name, it resolves to any one of the validators and then I get the front end. So all of this is possible and, and doable. You do have to pay attention to, uh, to security, of course. Uh, somebody could infiltrate your validator network and serve bad front end code that steals people's information or data. So uh, you'd have to guard against that by having some kind of a checksum scheme uh, in uh, in the code that you're you're sending uh, out, but um, uh, but it's entirely possible to do what what you're asking about. Uh, fairly straightforward. Would love to see it in action. Um, let's see. Uh, Bank of England. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Okay, there are some questions. What sets Avalanche apart from other layer one blockchain solutions? The fact that it works, the fact that it's fast, the fact that it scales, the fact that it can grow and absorb uh, any use case, the fact that it can be used for compliant asset offerings or compliant chain solutions, all of these set it apart. So Bitcoin is a single asset, single chain system. Ethereum is a multi-asset, single chain system. That's actually slow. Its finality is 50 something blocks two and a half minutes. Uh, and uh, Avalanche is a multi-asset, multi-chain system. That's one of the main things that's, that, that sets it apart. The consensus protocol is the fastest in terms of time to finality. It's the most decentralized. And uh, so I can go on like this. Why should developers consider building on the C-chain? Because they want the best technology. If you want to use 20 years ago's technology, you know there's, there's no shortage of those. Go be my guest. You could do that. It'll be just fine. Uh, you know, it's uh, you know could do signature accrual somewhere with like a small number of validators and so forth. Um, but if you really want a truly decentralized platform, something that's actually open, an equal playing field for all, then that's Avalanche. Okay, let's see. Is it possible to create Avalanche University? where bite-sized content will be created to create courses that everybody can take to participate, especially someone like me who is not a master of science student. Great, that's a good question. So um, yes, it's clearly possible. And um, those of you who know that I was a professor at Cornell University for 20 years will know that you know this is obviously the kind of thing that I live and breathe and so forth. So. Um, uh, so yes, absolutely. And to this end, we're thinking about uh, a new program. I don't want to take the wind out of my own sails by pre-announcing it here, but this is a great idea. And uh, we're very much in line with, with exactly what you're thinking about. This stuff should not be rocket science. It isn't. There are out people out there who uh, are incentivized to make it seem inaccessible. Who, who try to introduce a gazillion terminology, whatever words and so forth, and try to dazzle you with moon math. Um, I've, we've always been very open and we've always been very down to earth. And we want to make sure that we can create an environment for people where they can learn about these technologies, build on them, and, uh, and also do their career development on top of the Avalanche ecosystem. So that's what we're gonna be helping with I can't say any more about this. It's not going to be called Avalanche University. It's not designed like a university, uh, but it is a, a very much a, a community support, a ecosystem support project or a, or a learning project that, uh, that um, 
uh, that I'm excited about. And um, so I'll, we'll, we'll announce it when it's ready. Uh, we did do some hackathons and hackathons are in this vein, right? So you get together, it's a social event. You get to buddy up with other people who are also potentially looking for projects or they have a project in mind and they're looking for people. So hackathons are awesome and a lot of fun. Um, and uh, the last hackathon we did was in, uh, was in Berkeley, uh, California, and people came from all over. It was really fun. And uh, so I'm really excited about, uh, about that. Now we're doing the follow-on to that. Uh, we want to scale it up. So we want to have a hackathon that's far, far bigger than what's possible uh, in person. Okay, so um, uh, let's see. How does Avalanche's consensus protocol differ from other blockchain consensus mechanisms? Very simply put, there, are all, there were prior to us um, uh, just, uh, uh, just two different approaches to, to consensus protocols. You either do proof of work style consensus, also known as Nakamoto consensus or longest chain consensus. You either do Bitcoin or Ethereum one, et cetera, you know, proof of work. You either do proof of work or you do a classical consensus protocol. What are some classical consensus protocols? You know, all of these signature accrual uh, protocols. EOS was the granddaddy of all of them. Uh, Tendermint is a signature accrual kind of a thing. It's different, it's PBFT or whatever, it was a slight difference. Uh, Ethereum 2 is a signature accrual protocol. And uh, you combine all of these uh, they're all the same thing. It's like essentially you have a slot to fill and uh, you have a small number of people who can vote on that slot. And so you, you propose your block and then people submit their signatures. Uh, Solana uses this and uh, it's okay. It'll scale a little bit uh, to about 100 validators, maybe 200 validators, but it won't scale to more than that. And so when you go to, to try to support more validators, now people start to get creative. They start doing all sorts of hokey things with the, the different way that they count the validators. They start uh, doing hokey things with, with uh, dividing the validator set so that each slot is decided by a very small number, even though there's a bigger pool. So that's not quite the same thing. And it's actually very, very prone to, to attack. So, uh, so that's, all, that's what other people do. Avalanche operates differently. You can watch any of my videos from, uh, from when it was announced, but it's a, uh, it's a, it's a meta-stable protocol. It uses a different approach, different, uh, uh, different way of uh, gaining confidence in a decision. So whereas others are either doing proof of work or collecting signatures on a proposal, in Avalanche, you try to see if a proposal has enough support but instead of going out and collecting proposals from everybody yourself, which is the unscalable part of this because everybody's doing it in parallel, so there's a lot of signature collection going on. Instead, what you do is you ask around. You ask a small number of people to, to see if they think there is enough support for that thing. And they themselves ask other people who ask other people. So I don't have to go out and collect signatures from 100,000 validators. I ask just about 10, 10, 10 people who ask another 10 who ask another 10. And that's where the avalanche comes from. So I, I end up polling indirectly the entire set without having to communicate with every member of the set. That's where the scalability comes from. I hope that's useful. Um, if you want uh, much more detail, just go to any one of my talks from a few years ago uh, where I show this stuff. I also show how it avalanches to one side or another when there's a decision to be made. And, um, uh, and there are all sorts of uh, you know, fun graphs that you can take a look at. You can see that it's a, it's a meta-stable process. It's like, it's like being on top of a hill on skis and uh, on a very steep hill. And no matter what you do, you're going to end up, you know, the slightest motion will end up tipping you over. You'll find yourself at the bottom of, of the hill, either on one side or the other. So, okay, let's go on to the next question. How do you see the DeFi protocols and platforms evolving in the next five to 10 years? And what role do you see Avalanche playing in that evolution? So Avalanche is already one of the most innovative platforms and there are lots and lots of exciting dApps like Platypus, like Dexalot building on top of us. And um, so Avalanche will hopefully continue to foster 
uh, development and experimentation. And I would, I would love to see the cutting edge of DeFi continue to happen on Avalanche. And um, uh, let's see. So um, the evolution in the next five years is going to be first to copy everything that exists in DeFi, in, in TradFi. So lending platforms was one of the simplest things that your bank can do for you that we didn't have a counterpart for, but now we have Aave and others who can give us exactly what we want in terms of lending platforms. There'll be other, other offerings, uh, other DeFi, uh, DeFi protocols that come in line to, uh, to, uh, to, to support the kinds of things that you would do with your bank. Um, I suspect that we're going to see um, a, a much better DEXs. Uh, the DEXs that we have today are very, very uh, preliminary, I would say. So they, they, you know, Uniswap version two uh, or Pangolin, they, they used to experience huge, um, huge uh, slippage. And um, the, the new version three of Uniswap or uh, Trader Joe uh, liquidity book, they provide concentrated liquidity. They are better, but, uh, but they still suffer from MEV. They still suffer from lack of confidentiality. Um, I think DeFi protocols will end up trying to go after additional features that today they cannot offer. So confidentiality is one of them. Uh, MEV proofness or front, you know, guarantees against front running. These are these are the kinds of things that I think they need to address, and I'm not sure how they're going to do it yet. But but that that has to happen. Okay. Um, so let me uh, let me then. Uh, I mean, I can there's so much more to say, but we're running out of time. So let me uh, let me take the last question and then wrap up. Uh, last question is about ZKPs. What do you think about zero knowledge proofs and new encryption methods developed for blockchain privacy? I would really like to hear more about this topic from you. Okay, well, let me give you what I think. Zero knowledge proofs are a fantastic technology. They're very, very promising. They're very promising in, in, uh, in certain respects and in other respects, they are more promised than substance. And um, knowing how to navigate this is going to be very, very important and kind of difficult. There are some pitfalls. And one of the biggest pitfalls that many young graduate students fall into, and there are so, you could easily tell, uh, you know, what, what, you know what, there, there are some systemic failures of, of someone new to an area. And they get very excited in their first year. Every shiny object they love and they want to incorporate it, you know. Uh, it's one of the first things. Uh, the second thing that they want to do is some complicated things that that seem to have good theoretic um, uh, properties seem really appealing. Um, and, and a first or second year graduate student will not be in a position to evaluate their downsides. So zero knowledge proofs are fantastic for creating a proof without revealing uh, the, the some of the core core bits of information that went into the proof. So I can, for example, with, with a properly built system, uh, I will be given a certificate, a birth certificate, uh, or a, or an ID card, and I can prove to you that I'm I'm older than 18 without showing you my ID card. You don't get to know my 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 birth date. You don't get to impersonate me to my bank. You don't get to you know whatever take a look at the silly picture in my in my ID card. Um, but instead, I give you something that is completely satisfactory as a, as a proof of a property, you know, age greater than 18, without showing you the, the date of birth that went into it. So that's really, really cool and really, really exciting. And, uh, and so there are many uses for this, a gazillion uses for this, and it's badly needed in, the, in, in Web 2, because in Web 2, the very first thing that, they, that somebody wants you to do is to say, what are your credentials? Then you provide your session cookie. And then they say, oh, I know everything about you. They know every ad you've looked at. They know everything you've clicked on. And then they collect dossiers on us. And it's an absolutely horrendous experience. Every web page you go to, all these same ads follow you from web page to web page. And, uh, and zero knowledge proofs would, uh, would help with that kind of a scenario. Now, um, so there are some people out there who think that they could execute entire uh, smart contracts in zero knowledge. And um, so some there, there is some hope that that will someday be possible. But at the moment, it doesn't seem easy to do. And uh, 
and I've heard this for about a decade now, that zero, zero knowledge proofs have been with us for maybe multiple decades, three decades or so. Uh, and, uh, and I've heard for the last decade that, oh, they're really improving, they've improved a lot, they're finally practical, etc. If they were practical, they would already work. So the fact that they don't currently work tells me that they're not quite practical, that proof generation takes forever, that you know somehow the experience is, is lacking, that, that somehow your contracts have to be written in a funky language that no human mortal is, is capable of understanding or writing code in. So there are, there are downsides with this thing. And uh, I don't see zero knowledge as the ultimate end all. I think uh, what will happen, I, I can't wait to see some of the early zero knowledge uh, zero knowledge VMs, ZK VMs, because when they come on board, um, suddenly the dream will collapse into a reality. The dream, of course, the nice thing about dreams is, you know, they 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 span the space of possibilities. That that they will just be, they could be amazing. They could be on this end of the spectrum. And uh, when when they do materialize, they will materialize somewhere on the spectrum. And the ZK spectrum is such that. Everything in between, from the very best to the very worst, is guaranteed to be higher weight, slower than what you could do with lighter weight systems techniques. So you can get the kind of, uh, and there, there are other techniques that you could do to get confidentiality. There are other techniques that you can do to get execution integrity. And, um, and those uh, are typically far... Um, they require different assumptions, but those assumptions are practical in our current universe. Academics will poo-poo those assumptions. They'll be like, oh, you assume, for example, for confidentiality that there was a, there was a secure setup or that there was some kind of, um, uh, some kind of special hardware, et cetera, or, or there was a trusted entity doing, the, doing some of the, the, the steps. Um, in some, many cases, there are trusted entities. And no solution that I've ever built has relied on a trusted entity, but other people do do, do these, these things, and I find them to be perfectly fine. Um, so my academic colleagues would say, no, that's, that's not good, but uh, you, know, it's, it's, you already had that trust. In many cases, you already had that trust assumption anyway. I think it did not change anything. Um, and there's often, and there's today these days, there's trust, trustworthy hardware. So... Um, you know, is it nicer to not have to trust hardware? Sure, but show me your working thing. Don't give me the dream. Show me your working thing. Then I'll compare it to the working thing where I trust hardware. And, and I assure you that that working thing with ZK proofs is going to be far more convoluted than, than the other approach. In general, I tend to favor systems approaches that work as opposed to moon math that someday might work. So, uh, so that's sort of what I think about this. I am excited about ZKVMs. I want to see the first few come online. When they do come online, people will realize exactly what I said uh, is correct, which is they will understand that yes, ZK, ZKs are, are promising, but but maybe you know we'll we'll see the first instance, then we'll judge it. So I don't want to be prejudgmental, but I, my suspicion is the uh, the user experience will be abysmal. So um, I'm excited about those. Uh, there, are, there are other encryption or encrypted uh, execution techniques. There's multi-party computation techniques that are also really, really exciting. Uh, they could be used for blockchain privacy. And um, uh, all MPC techniques I know of are incredibly slow. So they would, be, uh, they would not be suitable, for example, for Dexalot, right? It's just too, that, that thing requires too high a performance uh, barrier. They would not be good for DEXs and trading in general. They might be very useful for other uses. So I generally like MPC protocols. Um, and uh, and if, you, if people want to build them on a blockchain, on a subnet, those are perfectly fine. And, uh, and there's cool stuff to be done as long as you find a good application with a low enough uh, set of requirements. I hope that's useful as just sort of uh, my, uh, my opinion on this stuff. I think uh, some ZKVMs are going to be unveiled this, uh, this spring. And uh, we will see, and, and you guys can judge me and come and remind me if I was way off. Maybe this thing is better than, you know, it walks on water and, and is better than everything else on earth. We'll, we'll see. So um, I, I suspect that, that it's not. So, um, so that's what I think. Uh, let's uh, maybe wrap up over here. Uh, let's see, what do I get to say at the end? It's been an eventful week. So um, it's been a fun week. 
Uh, there is a, a lot of things happening in the regulatory space. I generally don't opine on that. I think the regulators will do their thing. They have a very tough job to do. Um, I, I wish they had done their thing with uh, some of the centralized exchanges like FTX. I wish they hadn't driven FTX overseas where it failed. I wish that they had provided right line guidelines for us. And, um, but in any case, I do believe that they are good people trying to do good stuff. And uh, we'll, see, we'll see what they come up with. And um, uh, as for us, we get to build. We are techies. And uh, this, this uh, evolution is impossible to stop. And I think, I'm not sure when I was talking about this, but um, you know, here's a thought experiment. I like thinking about these extremes. Imagine that you and I and everybody stopped innovating. Imagine that, that we decided, you know what, guys, we're going to shut it all down. Okay? We'll just shut down every single chain. And we give it some time. Okay? So where will the world evolve to in, in, say, 30 years? Here is what I think would happen. Every Gen Zer who has ever touched a blockchain, every single person who's ever traded on a chain knows how convenient and how awesome these things are. And so by the time that they get older and, and occupy positions of power, they will all want to replace all these vertical silos, all of the incumbents, absolutely horrendous technical stacks. And I have seen the internals of the code at various companies, at various big, big Wall Street firms. And, and even the people working on them will tell you this is layers upon layers upon layers of crud. So as Gen Zers and as users of blockchains get older and into positions of power, they will naturally want to. They will naturally have to replace what they have with a better foundation. We have that better foundation. So adoption to me is just a, a preordained outcome. In 30 years, this thing will be everywhere. And in many ways, what, what's happening right now is kind of similar to what happened with peer-to-peer -peer file sharing technologies. Just you know, to wit, you know, what did happen with peer-to-peer -peer file sharing? We used to have to buy CDs. It was absolutely horrible. And, uh, and then somebody started, you know, they invented how to rip CDs and songs and then how to file share. And then you could download anything you wanted. And suddenly everybody and their brother were downloading songs because it was a lot easier than buying CDs and converting them to digital form. And you couldn't buy the MP3s from any legitimate source. You had to pirate. And then everybody came down on the space, you know, with the ban hammer. There were grandmas being sued. There were lawsuits flying and so forth. It was just pretty insane. So, and then what happened after that? Well, that bought the industry some time. Apparently, the industry needed about eight years, which is mind-boggling. They're so, so, so incredibly slow. All that payola, whatever it is that these folks do, you know, whatever they're busy with, they took them eight years to learn how to digitize songs and offer them for sale. And once they did, we are in the universe we are now. Piracy is almost zero, and all music is digital as it was ordained to be. The same is true for assets. We are going to be there no matter what. Even if everything stops in three decades, you know, the, the boomers are going to be replaced and all the youngsters are going to be like, yeah, let's just put this crap on the internet like it's meant to be. They're digital first people and they know exactly how this ought to work. So, so that, that eventuality is preordained. Anything that you hear in the news, you know, there's going to be noise all about this, that, and the other. Uh, it's essentially the industry buying itself time. And the comeback from that is going to be led by, I think, some of the TradFi firms finally realizing, you know what, we got to do this. This thing is so much better than this other stuff we have. And, uh, and when that happens, it's going to be like the floodgates are open. So um, in the meantime, of course, there was a bunch of crud happening in the space as well. And some of the regulatory crackdowns will hopefully cut back on, 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 the, on the crud that was happening, the unwanted, the fraud, fraud uh, uh, bearing behavior that, that we saw. So I'm thrilled about the bear market. We're building at Ava Labs. I know a lot of projects are building. I, I have people outside that I was just meeting with who are building really exciting things. And so uh, I can't wait to get back to that. And uh, I can't wait to, to build our way out of this. And we will show the world that our technology is just in every way superior. It's better than the software stacks at all of the companies on the island right next door uh, in Manhattan. And, and in London and in Singapore and around the financial centers of the world. So 
On that note, have a wonderful weekend and I'll see you on the chain. Take care. Bye-bye.